Hello, welcome back. I'm Matthew Sheehan and I'm going to be hosting the panel discussions this afternoon. So first up, who on earth am I and what on earth am I doing here? Well, shortly before computers were invented, and I'm not joking, shortly before they were invented, I was sitting right there where you are in the uh, lecture theatre, albeit one just down the road, studying yacht design. I did it, I qualified, just, but I did. And I moved into the industry and ended up working for a mask making company, um, Procter Mask, so I'm sure many of you have heard of, who are just down the end of the road. Um, and I worked for them for many years. I worked for them for sort of eight or nine years in all kinds of different areas. Uh, and then the obvious natural thing to do next was to become a sailing journalist and a TV producer. It's not an obvious pathway, but uh, that is where I ended up. And that's where I still am. But I say that because each time I come to these events, which I love doing, I'm reminded um, what it feels like to not really necessarily know where your career is going to go. Uh, it certainly was the case for me. And some of you may well be thinking the same thing. You may already be on some kind of path, pathway, but not actually sure which way to go. And I'm always the first to say that's really not a bad thing at all, because there's plenty of opportunity out there. So if some of you are feeling the same about your own careers, hopefully this afternoon will help to change that. But the interesting thing about the boat building business is that there seem to be so many seemingly unconnected things, links and roots that somehow link together and tell a story. And one of those examples is um, the America's Cup. And those of you who were here last year will remember that our panel was made up largely of, well, no, entirely actually, of people from Ben Ainsley Racing in the technical department who told us and gave us an insight as to what was going on and what we were about to see and uh, gave us a little snapshot of the future. And that was a year ago. So I thought it would be an interesting idea, first of all, to pick up on that. And here's a very short video. It is a very short video, uh, which some of you may well have already seen before, that just shows us and tells us what's been happening since then. It's quite an impressive beast, and I'm sure uh, many of you, like me, are going to be are really looking forward to seeing what happens when they go sailing. But looking at that, or oh, just in case anybody's wondering what on earth was it, well, it's the next America's Cup boat. It's an AC-75, it's Ineos, which is uh, Ben Ainsley Racing, renamed now and with their new sponsors, Ineos. And it's a 75-foot monohull, uh, foil, or foiling monohull. Um, using technology and a concept that has never been done before. So it's very, very exciting. Anyway, this video and thinking about Ben Ainsley Racing and Ineos got us thinking about the specialist support vessels that are required to just deal with boats like that. Boats that are capable of doing, we're told, are going to be um, doing in excess of 50 knots. And they require some really quite special vessels. And that, in turn led us to think about the huge number of specialist tenders and small vessels that are produced by British manufacturers. And so that led us on to think, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we talk about that? Because that is something that the UK is very good about, a uh, good at, rather. And so the theme of the panel discussion today is about sports boats and superyacht tenders. But if you're still wondering what on earth we're talking about, here's another, just a short video of some of the kind of boats we're talking about.
So we're clearly talking about some pretty special uh, and in some cases extreme boats. So here to tell us how far uh, the world has moved on in uh, sports boats and tenders, uh, we have a panel of experts, and I'd like to introduce those now. And uh, there's five of them, and starting with Andrew Hay from Princess Yachts. Right, Andrew. Uh, Kevin Hunt from Scorpion Ribs. Nigel Stewart, who we saw a little uh, earlier on from Spirit Yachts. Uh, Richard Watson from Pasco International. And a special guest, Charlotte Mill from the Solar Energy Boat Challenge. So, they, let's um, find out, first of all, what they do. We'll just have a quick, intro, a quick round of sort of introductions, really, as to what they do. Um, and I talked about America's Cup, and I want to start with uh, two of the people who have links to that America's Cup. We'll start with you, Andrew Hay. You're um, the uh, company naval architect at Princess Yachts in Plymouth. Indeed. Indeed. Tell us just a little bit about what your job involves, what you do. Um, so, very brief background to, to me. Uh, I started on a career path into naval architecture when I was about 13 years old. I was watching the, the little trailing vortices running down the side of a boat when I was sailing on a Wednesday evening, and I said, I want to know and understand what that meant and how those um, turbulent flows happened. Um, four years at university, this very university. I graduated from uh, Southampton in 1997 with a Master of Engineering in Ship Science then chartered engineer within a couple of years, and then I've sort of had a specialism in small boat technology, call it uh, what you will, uh, working through various leisure marine manufacturers from Hunter Boats in Essex through Sunseek and to now Princess uh, for the last, uh, well, 16 years off and on at Princess. And tell us a bit about, I referred to your link with the America's Cup. Tell us just a little bit about what that link is. We'll yeah, come back to so, the so um, we've got a, a very senior relationship with, uh, with Benazi Racing Technology um, through our chief executive and our senior management team from McLaren days. They work with uh, Martin Whitmarsh uh, and uh, the team at BAR. Uh, and BAR, after the last Cup, were looking at ways to make their business more sustainable and how to eliminate the peaks and troughs of an America's Cup cycle. So they were looking at other applications for that technology. There was a natural link with Princess, um, and through that link and a lot of discussions, uh, that developed into the R35 um, sports, uh, sports boat project. Which was one of the boats we saw on the video. It was the, the red one, that's our, our Columbia video, which we, uh, our marketing director was very pleased to win an award for. The, the I can years. see why. Okay, well, we'll come back to that boat in a bit more detail later on. Kevin Hunt, you're the managing director of Scorpion Ribs, you're based in Lymington, just yep. down the road. Um, you've also got a connection with Ineos. We must call it Ineos, really, I suppose. Ben Ainsley racing that was last year. Ineos is this year. What, what's your connection? Well, our connection was uh, really with the last uh, uh, campaign for the America's Cup. Um, our company, we supplied five chase boats for that challenge. Um, I do know that the team is still using those boats, but primarily they were looking for some high craft, uh, high speed craft to keep up with the speeds they were doing. Um, they were doing crew transfers, uh, and there was also a lot of telemetry electronic gear installed on our ribs, which basically there was a lot of sensors all over that cat. Everything was being fed back to the, um, to the chase boats, and they were then making alterations uh, to get better improvements. So we were quite involved with, you know, with regards to supplying those. To, mm, to, to specialist, yeah. specialist boats, that's for sure. And your company describes its boats as the ultimate ribs. And tell us a bit about why, why you describe them as Well, that. the company was started 20 years ago. I've been there for 10 years. And it, in the early days of ribbing, a lot of companies would take a little speedboat and put some tubes around it. Um, and call it a rib, whereas the, the, the guys who started Scorpion Ribs they actually sat down and designed a hull which was suited to um, sort of UK solent waters, which we all know are very choppy around here. Um, that in turn led to quite a lot of um, sort of clients who were using those early Scorpions for endurance race records. And what, what tended to happen is they were winning quite a lot of those races because of the, the design of the hull. It's not all about speed, it's about 
the boat being safe, comfortable and, and, and driving. And they were winning those races really because they were getting high average speeds in, in choppy conditions over and above competitors. Mm, interesting stuff. Well, we'll come back to that uh, a little later on. Um, Nigel, we've seen, we know where you're from, but um, what you were telling us about earlier on was very much based around sailing boats, but you're now into power boats. What's moved you over into power boats as well? Well, Spirit built its first power boat 15 years ago um, and has continued to slowly build motorboats, um, generally for people who want something a little bit different. You know, there are, as you'll see photographs later, that our, yacht, our motor yachts are very different in style. Um, and they have a bit of drama about them. So that's, we, we keep building them, and, and we're starting to build super yacht tenders because the demand has been there, and we've been asked to build them, so we're building them. All right, well, I'll find out a bit more about that in, in due course. Richard uh, Watson, you're the CEO at Pasco International. You're down the River Hamble, just around the corner. Nice. Um, tell us a bit about what you do, and your background, actually, because you studied in Southampton as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I graduated from uh, Southampton Institute, as it was then, um, on the yacht manufacturing and surveying course, um, in 2002. Um, I went on to, uh, I was involved in composites throughout my, my sort of education time and went on to work for a company called Hamatic, building um, military and uh, commercial ribs predominantly. Um, and that led naturally into the super yacht tender world and the link with ribs and I joined Pasco in 2007. Um, and I've been, been looking after Pasco ever since. Um, we started specializing in, in super yacht tenders really back in about 2004. Uh, and now our entire range and our entire sort of business ethos is around um, particularly semi-custom and custom yacht tenders for large yacht, luxury yachts. Um, it's a very specialist niche area of the market, uh, which has led us to, to, to really tailor everything we do to that marketplace and, and not build any ledger products anymore. Um, um, we now build tenders from five meters to 12 meters. So. Some of these boats are, are pretty sizable boats in their own right these days. Mm. Uh, certainly not the inflatable uh, Avons of old uh, that everybody would uh, immediately jump into their minds when they think of a tender. Did in mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and for, to put it into context, how important is, because I mean, I sort of outlined it a little bit in the introduction that the UK is quite well known for this, but put it into context how important the, the tender market is in the UK. Um, well, I think it's very important. Uh, I mean, to, to touch on tenders to start with, uh, I, I mean, over the last 10 years, the super yacht market ha has grown in terms of the size of the yachts they're building. We're now talking boats of, you know, 150, 160 metres plus, boats which can't come into port regularly. Um, so the tenders uh, are the lifeline for the yacht. They move crew, people, guests, food, rubbish to and from the shore. So the tender's absolutely critical. Uh, now, the UK manufacturing industry is, is a huge player in this market. I think Simon mentioned earlier that you, know, you go to Monaco Yacht Show and it's dedicated tender area, and you can see you know, something like 20% of the manufacturers are UK manufacturers. Um, and, and we've got companies everything, everywhere from Williams specializing in the sort of smaller end of the market. Kevin, obviously, building a lot of um, uh, tenders uh, with his ribs. Nigel at the, at the larger end of the market with the sort of 40 foot. Uh, custom wood tenders, and um, there's probably five or six other companies I haven't mentioned that Simon named earlier. Um, it's, it's a huge market for the UK market, um, and we're really leading the world, I think, in that marketplace. And it could well influence, you know, it could well be boats that many in our audience are going to be working on in the future. Absolutely. You know, a lot of, lot of the companies mentioned in the CPO tender market are the smaller companies, the kind of companies that maybe uh, the apprentices from the larger companies here would be, be looking to move on to later in their career. Mm. Oh, stealing already. Not stealing each other's stuff. <laughs> um, Developing their careers. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, we'll come back to that as well. Now, our fifth panelist is Charlotte Mill, um, who is the project manager of the Monaco Yacht Club Solar. Uh, energy boat challenge. Your work is at a very different end of the power boat scale, isn't it? Tell us a bit, first of all, about the solar energy boat challenge for those who haven't heard about it. Well, it's a, it's a challenge that happens every July in Monaco, and the aim of this challenge is to foster innovation in yachting and kind of imagine the yachting of tomorrow. So that's what we do. And when does that run? It's like a week long it's, event. It's, isn't it's it? five days. Uh, it also runs all, all year long through webinars and through some conferences, but it's uh, five days uh, counting that the teams prepare all year long uh, to be ready and compete. 
And it's a competition, isn't it? It's a competition. How many classes are there? Uh, there is three classes, um, but we also have conferences and workshops to, to have um, a discussion around this. It's not about all competing, it's also about making a link between the industry and the competitors, which are mo mostly students. So. How long has it been running? Um, it's going to be the seventh edition this year. So, and it's growing and growing each year. We see the interest of the industry, the interest of the universities, and the interest of our members, because as a yacht club, we're here to actually um, answer to our members kind of uh, questions and, uh, and wonders about what's going to be next for, uh, for the boats. Yep. Well, it's a fascinating project, and I'm really looking forward to hearing some more about that. And for anybody who hasn't come across it yet, I urge you, well, you will, once you've seen uh, Charlotte's presentation and, and the video, but it's an amazing challenge in, in Monaco uh, with electric power boats. And it's amazing because it gives a, a fascinating snapshot of what just might be possible, and in some cases, what is already possible in that world. But thank you, Charlotte. We'll hear from you uh, more on that a little later on. Okay, um, Andrew, I want to go back to the R35. So... Tell us about the R35. <coughs> that was quite an extreme boat, wasn't it? What, what made it, or what makes it such an extreme boat? Uh, well, there, there's two elements to that. One, um, the, the whole ethos of the R35 was uh, as a, a lightweight challenge. Um, the speed target was circa 50 knots. Uh, and to generate that sort of um, Speed potential meant that we had to really start our manufacturing process from the ground up. So we started with a blank sheet of paper. Um, we introduced carbon fiber uh, and vacuum, well, uh, pre-preg or sprint construction. So that meant that we had to introduce ovens and, uh, and a whole new plethora of technology that we'd never experienced before. It also introduced um, a whole new world of automotive-esque um, lifestyle experiences. So our chief executive was very keen to um, take the Tesla example um, and look at uh, human machine interfaces. So the, the touch screens, um, how the vessel was actually controlled and how it was operated. All of this was completely new for, for us and, uh, and our teams. Mm. I mean, given how advanced it was, it was new to you, so how steep was the learning curve, I would well, imagine? As, as I say, it was, uh, it was almost taking the playbook and throwing it in the bin and starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, when I started, the, uh, my involvement in this project right at the very beginning was, uh, was to say, OK, well, we're going to use this as an opportunity. BAR were adamant about the, the construction method materials, and, and we had to be able to use that as a, as a, as a spur to change how Princess de develop and move forward. Go, um, so I wanted to, I brought, wrote out a 20 bullet point list to my director and said, look, if we're gonna do this, we're gonna have to do this right. So it goes from talking, not talking about laminators, but talking about composite engineers and composite technicians, having clean rooms, having net edge molding so the guys lay up to the edge of the tool as opposed to going beyond and then trimming it off so there's no waste. Um, really highly efficient use of materials. We're trying to generate uh, what we called a, a boat in a box methodology where the parts would come pre-cut, ready to go, like a pizza delivery, and you take out the next bit and you lay it down. But that meant that the whole way we developed our boat had to change. Um, you know, and you can see on the screen some of the inbuilt shots of, of the boat uh, being built. We had to introduce paint booths. We'd never done production painting in, in this sort of scale before. Uh, you know, all the operatives, we had to train from scratch. We didn't have a carbon fiber manufacturing team. Uh, had to generate that from, from scratch and, and utilise some collaborative working with subcontractors, so we, we bought expertise in. Um, in terms of other technologies, again, the, the, the foil you can see on screen, uh, or the, the ride control system, as, we, uh, as we're, we're calling it, um, directly attributable to the America's Cup technology, um, but also integral in the hull design, the hull form. Uh, and we'll talk about sustainability as, as part of this conversation as it develops, but uh, one of the key things for Princess is that sustainability for us is all about fuel economy. It's about making our vessels more efficient. And the hull form of the R35 is, is very much a, a small dinghy in, in, in terms of its wetted surface and, and what it looks like. But that means that you haven't got the ability on a dinghy, well, in a dinghy you can move crew weight to, to balance it out. You haven't got that with a powerboat. You haven't got the, the dynamic ability to, to manipulate the weight on board or the central gravity position. So BAR have developed a ride control system with a pair of T-foils underneath the vessel, um, which 
secures the back end, gives us various different um, dynamic performances, so like your, your car would have sports or economy mode or dynamic settings. We can do that within the ride control system. Um, but it also means that some of the, let's say, less desirable features of the, the hull form, um, because of its optimization at low speed, um, we can continue to get the benefit of that performance and, and so on up the speed range, right up to 50 knots. And we're seeing uh, efficiency gains of somewhere between 25 and 30 percent um, at the low end cruising uh, end of the, the spectrum, uh, which is a, obviously has a huge benefit for, for clients because that's generally where people are operating the boats. Yeah, okay, we've got some nice potos of them blasting around at, at 45, 50 knots, but in general, they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating stuff, and it, it really does underline the big step forward that many companies are now sort of going through because of falling. But I just wonder about how it, inf how it affects your workforce. I mean, you touched on it there, where you said that you're, you, you didn't have operatives that were used to working with carbon. So mm. how did you move forward with your existing workforce? Did, did they retrain? Did you go through a process we had, of hiring uh, some in, or how did it work? Oh, so we, we hired expertise in. We used a, a subcontract team to, to come and help us over that initial vertical learning curve. Um, the other thing that we, we, we had to do was start from scratch, really, with how to deal with epoxy. Epoxy itself isn't very nice. Um, it, some people get very uh, allergic reactions to it. Um, so, and we're still dealing with some of the consequences of that. We had to try and minimise cutting, trimming, because trimming carbon fibre, black dust goes in the atmosphere. So our ventilation systems had to be improved. We built a bespoke factory to, to manufacture the boats. Okay, it's within the existing infrastructure. But all of that had to be stripped out and rebuilt and re-engineered specifically for this project. Um, in terms of how we engage the workforce, the, the team have, have got a, an open door policy to, to any of the technical team, any of the health and safety operatives, any of the, the other support functions within Princess. Any improvements, anything that people see, do, don't like, raise it. Um, we've got a, a don't walk by policy that we've introduced this year for specifically for health and safety across the yard. So if you see something and you've got a, uh, a moulding that's hanging off the edge of the table, well, you report it, you fix it, you do something about it there and then, and everybody is empowered to make those things ha happen. Um, it's all about engagement. We're, we're very much uh, trying to, to recast the, the, op the operation of the company in such a way that it, uh, it's very much more a collegiate and team working based. And I'm, uh, from a health and safety point of view, and that aspect I can see obviously it's so you've got to do it did did it change the way that the workforce felt about what they were doing as well I mean presumably you're all learning together because this is a very new project as you have Ab absolutely everything from the work instructions to how the tooling was developed and how it was put together um, completely changed and whilst we can sit in our, our delightful CAD op offices and, and say this is how we think it can be done, the 3D geometry all works and it all goes together like a lovely jigsaw puzzle. You get out on the shop floor, you talk to the guys and they go, nah, not a hope. So you have to re-engineer it, you have to take the lessons from the guys that are actually doing the job. If you didn't, then the business would fall apart. Completely. And that must be very re rewarding as well for, for everybody. I'd like to hope that, uh, I mean, we talked, the, the Pendennis uh, team uh, talked earlier about how f the pride of, of seeing something that they do and, and so on. I think uh, I'd like to hope that the, the team have the same sense of pride in the projects that they're doing. Um, when they see one of the boats trundling on the back of a lorry going out to a client or they see the videos that actually, yes, they, they did that, they contributed to it, they, they made it what it is. Mm. I mean, Kevin, just moving to you, you're, from a production point of view, you're a, a much smaller company with yeah. a small number of people, but you're building custom, custom boats as well. How much of modern materials affected you? Have you had to go through a similar process to Andrew? Um, we are semi-custom manufacturers. Um, but the, the biggest challenge we had when I first started with the company 10 years ago is primarily um, leisure boats that were being built for wealthy families, perhaps second homes. Um, we then started to get quite a bit of interest because of the hull formats. We have three formats, which we have many combinations, so we can do inboard, outboard, or water jets on all three uh, combinations. And we are very lucky that we can adapt to the niche market, which is semi-custom, and I think you would agree with, a little bit with that, Richard. Yeah, um, 
but when we were looking to, for the transition period from moving from leisure into the super yacht world, I have to, I have to say my, the team were not really um, up for it at the start, and it was quite a challenge um, because they were very much used to building production boats and super yacht tenders. We don't build super yacht tenders. But what they didn't realise is the whole formats were so good to get it into a super yacht tender, it's really the niceties and, and you know, a lot of clients will come and look at this boat. This is a standard 1080 for us. And we have one in particular who says, well, yeah, I really like it, a super yacht client, but I don't need that back seat and I don't need the forward seating because he wanted to put his bikes up forward. So, so we then, you know, we, we then semi customise those. So, for instance, what you're seeing uh, on the screen here now is the new back seat that we designed for this one-off project. Um, so, first and foremost, we go to the design team. Um, fortunately, we are in the world now where we've um, scanned all of our mould tools, so we can, we can now work with CAD. In, in the early days, it was all drawn by hand, and you had a couple of guys in the shed whistling away for a few months, and uh, then all of a sudden a new back seat came out. Well, we've moved on, so, you know, in that side of things. Um, and then if we can just push that next slide on again. So, so there you'll see... From, from the design, we had a one pool mold tool made, and there's the actual back seat molding there. Um, and if we can just move on that slide. Um, so that, that, hut, that boat basically is the same as that, the, the black 1080 that we saw at the start. And we semi custom, so we took out the forward seating and, and we put a new back seat on. So this, this guy actually has five scorpions, he has two big super yachts. This, this is on an expedition yacht that he owns, and he's a very big fan of, of what we're doing. And, and the fact that we do semi-customise, he likes to come and, and get involved in the design of that. And if, if we can achieve it, we will. Um, the only thing we won't do is, is play with the whole designs or formats, because we know they're well proven. Mm, impressive stuff. I mean, why have just one scorpion when you can have five? I mean, it's obvious, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, what was going through my mind, I was thinking, I have it, but I need another three, at least. What about materials, sir? So we hear about um, Andrew's work of sort of carbon fibre and learning these new processes and the rest of it. Has that affected you? Are you sort of wrapped up in...? Well, we, we were traditionally laying mouldings by hand, and I'm sure most of the audience have probably seen uh, hand laminating. Four years ago, I introduced, uh, with the help of some sort of supply companies, resin infusion. So we now resin infuse our hulls and our decks. And there are lots of benefits with that, but the one that always sticks out to me really is reduction in styrene, um, because it actually means that you, your workforce are a, a lot safer in, in a closed um, moulding situation as, as opposed to an exposed moulding situation. Um, we did use, uh, we, we, we have to change our materials, um, sort of combination mats, etc., to get the, to get the uh, strength we're looking for. But you can get a weight reduction, which is a big benefit, because then you, you, you're putting in less power to hit that 55 knots, mm. which is a standard speed for us. We can go more, um, and with the water jets, we can go less. Um, I was talking to Richard um, yesterday. Um, anything over 55 knots, I really think you're in powerboat, um, raceboat territory, and I certainly wouldn't want to you know, deliver a 67 knot boat to uh, someone who's got lots of money because all he's going to do is go and kill himself at the end of the day. So we have a responsibility there as well, you know, to, to ensure that what we're handing over, that the clients are also suitable to take on those sort of speeds. Mm. Well, as a died in the wall sailor, when you talk about 55 knots, you're already scaring the hell out of me. So um, you talked about um, the workforce being reluctant to take it on to start with. Has that that's now changed? Is it? It sounds like you've gone through quite a quite a journey. Yeah, we've 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 changed the way we operate the business as well. So now what we do is obviously we just have discussions with the client, and and now I bring the senior department heads into the into the dis design discussions because I've worked for many companies where designers are fantastic, flair, you know, excitable people, but when it gets down to the shop floor level, it doesn't actually go together. Um, so I, I realised that, and I'll bring the team in, in at a very early stage because, you know, if you spend eight hours 
in, in an office, you come out there with you know, a project ready to start to be designed. So if you can get the team involved from the outset, then, then it's, you get a much better outcome. I can say now, um, each Superyacht tender that we sell, the guys are quite excited to see what we are going to be building. Um, and I'm talking guys on the shop floor now because we have the senior guys in the early door. So, no, the, the ethos has changed in the company and we're, we all uh, approach these uh, projects as a team now and we're very successful at that now. Mm. I want to keep the composite theme going. So I want to talk to Richard, and particularly because Kevin's just talked about super yachts and super yacht tenders and you mentioned it in the opening introductions about how the, the roles of, of tenders and... I know when you were explaining it to me uh, a little while ago, I, I sort of knew it, but then I think I didn't know it. Just remind us what these boats are used for. It's not just about nipping to the shore and back, is it? Absolutely. You know, a large yacht these days is relying on the tenders to do absolutely everything that's connected between the yacht and the shore. So that might be supplying the yacht with food for 100 people that are on board, or transporting the owner from ship to shore. Something like the limousine tender that's on the screen behind me at the moment is specifically designed to cosset the guests in, in air-conditioned comfort between, between the yacht and the shore. If they've travelled from their house on their private jet and from the airport in their S-Class Mercedes, they don't necessarily want to get on an open rib to get to their seven-star floating hotel that is the yacht. And that's where a vessel like this comes in. We also go through sort of various other sports boats like the Kevin's company specialises in. Um, we offer beach landing craft, so if the guests want to go and have a barbecue on the beach or a sunbathe on the beach, you have a boat that can deliver them to the beach without getting their, their leather loafers wet. <laughs> um, and, and more recently, a lot of our development's been uh, in, in, like I say, working boats, so we've, we've produced... Um, uh, recently, a, a large catamaran with a with a crane on board to, to help load stores onto the catamaran and load the, the stores from the catamaran onto the yacht. Um, because, yeah, like I say, 100 people on board, it takes a lot of a lot of equipment to, to feed, house, clothes, and obviously rubbish back off again. Mm. The, I mean, all of what you're saying leads me to think innovation is quite a key thing. We've already heard it from from the first our first two guests. But innovation sounds like it's at the heart of this. Completely. It's absolutely pivotal in what we do, and I think it's pivotal in, in where the UK excels in the super yacht tender market. Um, what we tend to find is if we develop a new idea or we uh, come up with a new concept, you tend to find other manufacturers are two, three years um, later coming up with their own similar derivatives of that, that idea. So obviously where we can stay ahead is by coming up with the next idea first and putting that to market first. Um, so we invest a lot of time and effort in, in new product development in terms of our, our more production products and also um, building basically whatever the client wants on the more custom products. Um, we will literally sit down with a client and say, okay, you know, what do you want? What do you want to do with it? Where do you want to go with it? What do you want to achieve through this vessel? Uh, and start with a blank sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And I can, see, I can see that happening, certainly at the sales point and the design point and the rest of it. But it sounds like this, I mean, given that we're talking to apprentices here and people who are looking to spend, um, carve out careers in the industry, how important is it that they buy into that as well? Oh, absolutely, completely. You know, it's not about um, us all sitting in an office getting increasingly more grey hairs coming up with these ideas. Nothing wrong with grey hair. By <laughs> well, I don't, but I appreciate that. <laughs> but no, the, the, you know, the next generation and investing in the next generation, and they're the ones with the new ideas, the fresh ideas, the thing things that us old duffers haven't thought about yet. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, at that Pasco, um, we work very closely with our team on the shop floor, as Kevin's described. Um, we work very closely with our apprentices. We, we, we also bring in a lot of um, graduate design engineers on the, on the computer side as well. Um, because I think, you know, those, those, they're bringing the fresh ideas. They, they are the, the push for tomorrow, and they're the push for things like you know, um, sustainable technologies. Yeah, it's, their, it's their generation that are going to be suffering more than our mm. generation. And you mentioned, I just want to also go a little further on the innovation side, because you mentioned landing craft. I mean, yeah. that, tell us a bit about that. I mean, I know you did describe a bit about it, but you were telling me where some of those ideas had come from. Yeah, so, I mean, we were specifically sort of driven by that with a, with a customer who, who um, wanted to travel to shore in, in areas where the infrastructure is not 
quite as good as it is in the south of France, for example, um, and wanted to go to shore but was getting a little bit too old to be climbing over a rib tube and, and wading through the water to get onto the, the glorious Golden Beach. Um, so the idea came up to, to have an opening hydraulic door like a military landing craft. Um, I think we saw a picture of one of Kevin's boats with a similar arrangement earlier on. Uh, I think in my pictures here we've got one that comes around eventually. And the idea of a hydraulic opening door, so you can drive the vessel up to the beach, you can unload your, uh, your equipment for the day, and you can spend the day on the beach without, without having to wade through the sea or climb over, climb out of a boat. Um, and that, uh, that idea has developed hugely. I think most manufacturers in the, in the super yacht industry are now making a tender with a, with a beach landing arrangement. Um, we offer various uh, versions of that from five metres up to ten metres. Um, and it's yeah, it's a huge, huge part of what we do. Probably just, just out of interest, what's the propulsion unit then at the back? What are you using? Ah, so quite often you find that the, the people's philosophy is: if I'm going to be driving into a beach, I need a water jet. But actually, in my experience, both through military boats in my previous career and, and through super yacht tenders, is, is often stern drives a, a better option for a landing craft, purely because you can trim the drive to keep the propeller out of the sand, but you don't risk this issue of uh, water jets sucking out a lot of sand and stones which can cause a lot of internal damage to a water jet. I thought you were going to say tractor wheels. Seems more appropriate to me. <laughs> well, there are people who are going down that line, but um, oh, really? <laughs> it's not something we've uh, it's investigated at Pasco. <laughs> um, from high tech to traditional, Nigel, we heard from you with your, um, about sailing and, and what you do at Spirit Yachts. Um, and you did talk about wood, but just remind us why wood is such a good material. Uh, first of all, it's light. Um, so if you, if compared to carbon fibre, it's, it's pretty close. You know, we can all split hairs where you make a lighter boat. This boat you're looking at now is four tonnes finished. So it's light. Um, but really, for us, it's the, it's the flexibility of build. We don't need to make a mould. Like Kevin was saying, you make a mould to make a part. We don't need to do that. We can literally get our guys to... You know, we do a drawing, we hand it to the shop floor, and, and, and in a way, we, we work a little bit differently, but in the same way. We, really involve the shop floor guys to build stuff. And we try and draw um, enough for them to build the, what we're building, but not overgo in the information. So the guys on the shop floor can see what they're building, but they're not constrained by it. So they have an element of flair and artistic uh, moment in what we do. So the hull shape would be very well controlled. But when we get inside and they're making a bench, if putting a nice radius in will be right, they can put their hand up and say, do you mind if I just put a curve in here? And timber allows you to do that because you're using the skills of the people on, in, on the shop floor to, to put their artistic flair in it. Um, and there's certain bits of the, uh, everything we make where we allow them sort of as a vanity table to put marquetry in, but that's up to them. They meet the customers. The customers come in the factory and they get a gist of who they are. So the same team builds the whole boat from beginning to end. Um, and the customers come in and they meet this team and get to know them. So that interaction is very small. So why wood? Well, it's because it's got that ability to be very flexible in what we're building um, and very much a client get involved. So that they like that relationship. Rather than with, with a mould, you are down to a drawing and the mould will make it precisely what you've, you've come with. But how, how much is the workforce now or the skill sets polarising into sort of composite building on one hand and the kind of intricate skills that you're talking? I mean, if, if one of the apprentices decides I want to go down wood, does that commit them to that direction for a while or can you swap between the two? Or? Uh, generally people who are doing apprenticeships in, in cabinet making or, or working the timber part of other people's businesses will fit in with our business once we've shown them how we do it. Um, if they've come from a laminating composite bit, well unfortunately we don't do any of that. Although we do do some carbon laminating but it's so small I get an outside contractor to come and do that laminating because he's got the skills and the people who do it every day. Um, so yeah, yeah. I suppose once you've gone down the wooden route, you're either building the interior of yachts or you can come with us and build the hull and the interior. Mm. And is there, a, a, from what you hear from the other guys, is, do you feel there's a synergy there? Are there things that you recognise in the way their businesses are going? I'm thinking more about the future development of the new materials. I mean, I'm sure, you know, wood's a very traditional material, but epoxy resins, for example, are developing all the time, so a bonding agents and the rest of it. Yeah, I, we are. I mean, one thing that they mentioned earlier is um, um, styrene from an built resin. Um, that is a problem, and it's, a, it's about to be banned, and it's been about to be banned for about 15 years. So we're waiting for it is banned. Um, so you're getting epoxy. We use epoxy on everything. So we've done the epoxy hurdle of health and safety, the epoxy. Um, and that's 
so we are using very similar materials, and, and, but we, would, we will be made to move you know, by legislation. And when that happens, we'll all stop using, or polyesters and vinyl esters will be stopped, unless you can do it in a completely enclosed environment, which is difficult with gel coats. Um, so there will be a move to all of us, and we'll all end up painting. Um, you know, and gel coat's got real benefits for some owners. We don't use gel coat, but it has a benefit to your owners. But what they'll end up doing is when it's banned, because you can't do gel coat in an enclosed environment, you'll end up painting. And that's just development, and it will be part of the environmental elements. Mm. And so the, the specialist skills of working in wood and the rest of it, do you, with so much being focused towards composite construction, is it getting harder to find a workforce that work in wood? And, and Not really to work in wood. Funny, I think probably we've all suffered the shortage of decent DC electricians who can work in two wires, I was nodding on there. Because <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. electrics have changed enormously, and we're now using two-wire program to reduce the amount of copper in a boat to make it lighter, to make it more performance and be more sustainable. Um, so finding people who can work in 12, 24, 48 volts, and they're now 400 volt DC, you know, it's, a, it's something that, they, that is a new, it, the trade's moving very fast. And on top of that, we want them to do AC, because you know, the hairdryer's got to work. Um, so the, getting a good electricians and then good engineers who, or mechanical engineers, people who have done refit work on yachts or, or you know, I say boats, yachts, whatever you want to call it, um, who've done refit as well as new build because the new build people need to understand what goes wrong so they can instinctively not do stuff for someone else in five years' time to be swearing about how they installed something. So those are the two trades I think are the harder ones, joinery, Everyone is doing cabinetry making because most interiors and most yachts are built of wood, you know, or some form of wood. And all we do is adapt those skills into building a hull and deck. Mm, interesting stuff. Well, part of, as we know, part of your, your uh, message earlier on was about sustainability, which um, leads me on to um, Charlotte. Because sustainability in the modern world, it's... Uh, it's a key issue throughout our world, isn't it? And uh, electric power is at the front of that. We heard about the Tesla. And what we know about the Tesla, we saw some pictures of the Tesla. Um, and Charlotte's going to explain a bit more about uh, the project that she's involved with that we talked about just briefly a little bit earlier on. Before she does, here's a little video, just a sample of, of what this uh, challenge is all about.
fascinating stuff. I'm not going to say any more. Charlotte, over to you. Tell us, tell us a bit about this. <coughs> so, yes, the Monaco Solar and Energy Board Challenge is now in uh, its seventh edition. Um, it started in 2014 when we invited for the first time a class that is already existing um, and running in the Netherlands, which is a solar class, uh, to come and race in Monaco because historically Monaco had seen power boating trials since 1904. So in 1904 already, we were having the first power boats and the first uh, motors being tested in Monaco because at the time you didn't really have circuits for the cars to try the motors on a, on a, for a long time. So they would put the motors in the boat and come and race um, in front of the rocher. So now, fast forward, we're in 2014, and we welcome our first teams, uh, for the, which is the solar class, which are both fully dedicated to solar energy. And in 2017, we launched uh, another class because we wanted to invite the industry to joining and to think, okay, solar is not the only solution. We need to think about all the other uh, energy possibilities, and we need to invite the industry into this story because there is a future for that. So in 2017, we, we opened the offshore class where we saw our first um, ready-to-sell boats participating and also some of our um, prototypes coming. And then the thought was going forward and saying, okay, but yeah, but the boats who are currently on the market, they're using electrical uh, motors, uh, batteries, but what about hydrogen? What about compressed air? What about any energy combination? So that's why we launched the Monaco Energy Class in 2018, where the combination of energy can be used to uh, propel your boat. So this year, um, we saw the first teams using hydrogen joining us. We had two, um, and that was pretty exciting for us. Uh, we'll speak a bit, a, a bit more about this later. And next year, uh, well, we have, again, new university joining in because we, we're welcoming universities and uh, the industry to, to this event. So it's growing each year. So to go back to why we're doing this, our vision, as I said earlier, is to imagine the yachting of tomorrow. We strongly believe that by fostering and promoting innovation, uh, we will get to that next step in that industry. We have uh, our members, we have uh, our connection, who are all telling us we want something developing in this. So that's why we're organizing this uh, each year. So we're federating the industry and the university students together because, well, it's not a subject one person can look at. So what we do is we also aim at preserving the environment. So we, we not only launch the zero emission challenge to the teams participating, but we also launch it to ourselves. So during the event, uh, we try to be as much as low emission as possible. So this year, uh, our challenge uh, was to actually use zero thermal motor on, on, on the water for the organization. So from uh, committee boats, from uh, safety boats, uh, VIP press boats, everything was electric. And I guess uh, a lot of you are sailors, you know what is a challenge of uh, following a race with uh, only electric boats, uh, it, it was quite a challenge and it's a new way of thinking, a new way of um, getting to, to, to organize something. What we also did, we, we said, okay, it's nice to do that at, on the water, let's do it also on, on, on the ground. So we only had hydrogen and electric cars uh, for the whole event for our, our need, transfer needs. We also pushed the team to use the electric boat bus. Uh, we used a dynamic positioning buoys at some places. So you will tell me why is that zero emission? It's also because when you speak about zero emission, you also need to think about sustainability and not tempering with the ground. So with dynamic positioning buoys, not only you get something actually um, that is very, um, very, very precise, like you tell them you go there, they go there, so you can have a very good quality in organizing your, your event, but also you're not damaging uh, the sea ground. So why, why work on this? Well, when we look at it, um, between the IMO, uh, the, Marine, the Marine Environmental uh, Protection Committee, there are going to be more and more um, emission, um, sorry, how you go? Um, I lost my English. <laughs> ECA, emission controls areas, and uh, those are already defined and they will be growing. Uh, so we will, we will need to be able to supply those kind of zero emission boats to your potential clients, to the members of the Yacht Club, and uh, to, to your clients as well. 
So what, are, uh, what is a challenge? So we have three classes. So as I said earlier, we have the solo class, which is our historical class. They already race uh, other places in the world, but what we wanted is to bring them to Monaco and challenge them a bit, because they were used to kind of reuse the same boat every year, and what we do is now we're pushing them and telling them, okay, it's nice to reuse the same boat. I mean, there is quite a sustainable thinking in that, but think about energy efficiency, think, think about your motors, think, think about what, what about adding foils. So this is what the solar class is. We have the Monaco Energy class. This is more like the one design. If you're, if you're sailing, one design, everybody has the same hull, everybody has kind of the same set of rules. This is the same thing. We provide the hull, a catamaran hull, to each of the team to put everybody on the same ground. And what we tell them is, okay, you build the cockpit and you build the propulsion system. You're allowed five kilowatt of energy, whatever energy you're using. So it can be a combination of hydrogen, uh, battery, whatever you want, uh, as long as you fit in the rule. And you're allowed a secondary um, energy source, source, such as solar if you want, or wind. And then here you go and you compete against each other. This is to kind of put all the energies on the same line and say, okay, you all have the same regulation, which one will win? Uh, the third class, which is open sea class, it used to be called the offshore class, but we, we're not here to make race boats. We're here to show what will be the leisure boat of tomorrow, what will be the tender of tomorrow. That's a class where uh, the boats can be up to 40 feet and uh, need to be able to have one pilot and two passengers on board. Because if it's just to have one pilot on board like the other classes, then you're not showing to the potential client that, oh yes, I can use that boat in my day-to-day -day life. So I, I show you a, a few pictures of these classes. As you see in the Monaco Energy class, you have some quite uh, very easy looking, um, basic looking um, projects such as very more developed ones. And the open sea class is, is something that we see more and more interest as well. Um, some of the teams were uh, playing in the solo class and are raising to reach the open sea because they see there is a real market behind this. They see there are opportunities for them, for their university or for uh, their company to develop into something bigger. So in terms of the energy mix this year, so we are now around 60% on solar, uh, full electric 30% and hydrogen with 10%. Um, our prof participants are mostly 28% professionals and 72% uh, students. In, in regards to the challenge, what we try to do as well is to push for innovation. So it started in 2014 with four basic courses, fleet race, qualification, slalom, championship race, and a speed record. But then we thought, okay, how do we push for innovation? By giving them new uh, challenges. So in 2019, we launched a 60 nautical mile endurance race. Uh, we launched a 32 nautical mile um, under, a second endurance long race to see, could they do it? And the answer was, Meh. the 32 nautical mile race is actually uh, a solo boat who won it because they managed in, uh, in four hours by going quite slow uh, to cover the distance because they recharge while they, while they sail. Whether the, the other contestants, which, uh, which do not have solar panel, had to stop uh, at the harbor and recharge, but still they managed to, did it, to do it. And the, the idea is that next year we're going to be doing 60 nautical miles. Why? Because some of our participants are very keen to, to, to display to the public that today the boat can do this. And, and to say to the public, now you can buy a boat which has uh, electric, uh, electric motorization. We, uh, we added, and this year, so we had a very good, uh, also quite a good news. We're not here to make records, but until 2016, in, in 2016, 26 knots was a speed record uh, by a solo boat. And this year we had the 40 knots uh, by one of the offshore class boats. So that was quite also, that is something, that's a message we pass. Okay, you want to have fun a little bit of speed, you can also do it. Honestly, for how long, that's also a matter of uh, <laughs> what we're working on. So what are the key facts and figures? So this year we had 350 participants within 34 teams from 14 nationalities. I have to say the Netherlands is coming very strong and um, I'm, I'm very sad to say that at the moment there is only one half Scottish, half Italian team. So I'm hoping that Great Britain is gonna wake up and join us next year. Uh, on these 350 participants, we have about 200 students. Uh, so from 20 universities, the furthest team was from Indonesia this year. 
and so our speed record was 40.22 knots. Um, we also have on the side an exhibition, because the idea is also, okay, if you don't want to race with your boat, which is understandable, you, you still want to, to be able to show to uh, your pot potential, to the potential market that you exist, so we have also an exhibition. But what is also very important, we have conferences around it, uh, to which I welcome you all to join. Uh, it's all uh, free attendance. Uh, this year, we, we went on to uh, subjects such as the refit of uh, a boat for the extreme, uh, coming from the extreme E Formula One. They're organizing a new race uh, around the world, and they're gonna be using a 108 meter boat that's gonna be transitioning to renewable energy. So we see more and more of those people uh, who are getting interested. We had World Sailing who joined us and explained to us about their sustainability agenda, because World Sailing is also thinking about this, and they're transitioning slowly and slowly their ribs uh, to uh, zero emission means, which is a challenge also. I mean, so, Speaking about the zero emission challenge for the Yacht Club, by using only zero emission um, engines, uh, we saved 21 um, CO2 tons, which is nothing compared to what uh, we produce when we organize an event, but it's a starting point. So the, the aim is that each year we, we save more and more by um, finding as many solutions as we can. So if you have a great solution, whether it is for recharging or solar pontoons, I mean, we, we look at it as a, a marina, as a yacht club, as a full organization. So you're, you're all welcome to, to come and meet us and tell us about your ideas and let's work together. It sounds like a, a fascinating project. I, I'm just gonna stop you there because I'm, key, I'm conscious yeah. that we're pretty close on time and I want to just get, we've got a few minutes left. It's a massive topic clearly and it's fascinating and um, I'm sure it would have sparked, or I hope it would have sparked some ideas in our audience. I want to just say, what does our panel think about that? I mean, here's a snapshot of the future. I mean, Kevin, how, is this going to apply to you? you? You look at this and you think, that's where we're going. Well, I think whether we sit here and like it or not, I think it's the way the industry is going. The, the big challenge we have at this moment in time is the power packs are, are not there for our sort of boats we're building to get the speeds that we're looking for that our clients want. Um, I would love to be able to fit, a, you know, 10 electric batteries and get, you know, a power, you know, plant in position to, to reach 55 knots, but the market... <sighs> The, the technology is not there for us at this moment in time. Mm, but it sounds like it's coming, doesn't it, by the, by the I, look of it? I think it's this. growing behind the scenes, yeah. and, and I think there's probably a lot of people working on it, but it's, it's just not there at this moment in time. How about, how about for you, Andrew? I mean, you're talking about bigger boats. I mean, what's your view on this? How are you going to embrace well, there's, it? There's, there's, there's three elements here. One is, uh, and Charlotte put it up on the slide, the, the IMO, um, there's going to be legislation. We, we've been working for six, seven, eight years on solutions to put our large boats, our 40 meter, 35 meters into ECA areas. Um, and we've got to be very careful about that because the, the legislative regime, for example, on ECA is they're looking at NOx. Now, when we've found a solution to, to give us the, the NOx requirements that we're being obligated to meet, um, it makes the boat less efficient. We have to put a huge selective cathodic reduction system in. It weighs one and a half tons, so two of those. You've got urea, you've got injection units. The, the catalyst isn't recyclable. So actually, we're trying to solve um, one environmental challenge, and we make the boat worse, and we make a bigger impact on the environment because we're trying to solve one particular <coughs> microcosm of the problem. <coughs> The legislation will move. Uh, we're already having discussions about how, um, how we can regulate CO2 production, not just in terms of how we manufacture the boats with the, the UK government challenges that are coming in 2050, but actually how the, the boats are going to be used. So we've got that sort of things to, to deal with. And more importantly, when we start talking about CO2, um, the only way you can really assess CO2 is look at whole life. So we've got whole life assessments, and that brings us right into the real crux of our problem, which is going to be the end of life and then how we deal with that. Mm. So th there's a, a legislative element to it. There's also the, the client-driven approach. You know, we're not seeing yet um, our clients banging the table saying, give me an environmentally friendly boat. It will come. Um, more importantly, actually, we're, we're seeing it reverse engineered, if you will. So it's the shop floor, it's the team. I've got one of my engineers is saying, okay, well, why haven't we put solar panels on all our factories? 
You know, those sort of things, that it's, it's actually going to be organic, driven from the company says, this is what we want to do. Um, actually getting to a position where us, Princess, Sunseeker, all our other collaborative teams out there, the, the panel, we're actually going to be driving it. Um, because it's the right thing to really well do. Um, our products are entirely reliant on having a good environment to be in. That's, it's a discretionary per purchase for our clients. If the, if the sea and the conditions out there are not nice, well, the industry dies. Yeah, and it's clearly a huge, it's a huge topic. We, just a quick one, Matt. Um, yeah. is, if you just, as much as we're talking about motorboats here, sailing boats, you can put batteries in, heavy, put them in the right place, it makes the boat sail better. We're talking about power boats. You can't forget that batteries are a tenth of the energy density of diesel. Mm. So you'd need... Ten you know, so much more, 10 times more of the weight on the boat and batteries to have the same 50 knots we're talking mm. about. So it, it, there's a huge challenge in this. And we will always have motorboats. It's, it's, at the moment, it's about how we make them more efficient. Batteries have got a long way and, to go. Until such but times it, it, as the client, the, the client base are changing the way they operate the boats. Yeah. We talk that, about a 55 knot yeah. target. Well, if we're suddenly talking about, actually, uh, you know what, I want to drive around at 12 knots. <laughs> Well, it's a different regime, it's a different yeah. mindset, yeah. and it's a different Ed challenge. Educating mm. the client on, yeah. on range and, and speed expectations suddenly allows you to unlock certain, certain restrictions. You know, if you have a client that says, I only want to cruise at 16, 18 knots, you can do a lot on your drive line, your hull form, whole form to suddenly you reduce your, uh, mm -hmm. you know, your mm -hmm. energy consumption that suddenly brings that energy storage requirement down and the whole lot becomes more practical. Technology is also moving on at a huge rate. Mm. Um, Nigel mentioned the Black Pearl in his um, speech earlier. When we built the tenders for Black Pearl, which you saw in my photos that popped up earlier, um, the client wanted to have the tenders fully electric. Mm. And in 2015, the technology just was not there. Whereas now, in 2019, the technology is there. We have a solution for that. There's restrictions on range and speed with that technology that will slowly lift as, as yeah, batteries. And we're, we're almost seeing not only the storage the, density increases. It's not just the, the the systems that are there to treat the the nasty stuff that comes out. We've mm. we've got we're almost there with hybrid systems. Um, you know, nobody quite has worked out exactly what the hybrid is supposed to be doing. Is it um, removing a, a generator so you can moor up in a, in, a, in a bay and not turn your generator on? Is it for that leaving the marina um, mm. without waking up the neighbours or putting lots of black smoke into the atmosphere. Um, but once we've, we as an industry, and it's going to have to be industry-led, have crystallised upon a, a view of what a hybrid system will do, then you can get the engine manufacturers to invest. We're on a... Uh, we're on a red light. We're, red light. we're on a red light. We're on, we're on light. the light. <laughs> light. <laughs> we're on the light. <laughs> and it's also a huge, huge topic and a fascinating one. And I suspect we've also got the topic for next year's conversation. Mm -hmm sorted out. But thank you very much indeed, uh, all of the panel. It's been a fascinating uh, conversation. I'm um, sorry we've run out of time, but there you go. That's just a mark of it. So thank you to the panel. Thank you. We're good.